If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. John 15, 10 through 11. Yeah, before we get started, if you have been blessed or positively impacted by the involvement of our youth and young adults this morning, can you just give them an amen? Yeah. Amen. Um, it's exciting to me, uh, not only because they make my job easier and more fun, uh, but also I, I hope it's exciting for you that uh, this is the future of our church and their, their eagerness to get involved and uh, to take part in something like this. It's, it's exciting. Um, for me, when I was growing up, uh, I grew up in a, a town called Walla Walla, Washington. Uh, and for those of you who don't know where that is, uh, it's in southeast Washington, and it's one of these Avenist hubs. Um, it's where there's an Avenist university there. There's a lot of churches. It's a small town. It's in a valley. Um, everybody's kind of just really concentrated. It feels like Avenist Salt Lake City, um, except like a small, small town vibe. Um, so growing up there, I grew up there until just before I was a teenager, uh, I, I got to uh, be around a lot of church things. Probably 90% of my time was spent either uh, in church, uh, at a church school, or at least around some church-going people. A lot of church-adjacent uh, time I, I spent before I was a teenager. And there was, uh, looking back on it, I think... A lot of good and some potentially not as good things that, that came out of that. Uh, a good reason that that, that was good um, was that uh, I had a lot of people around me that affirmed my faith as I grew up. Uh, they taught me that God made me, God loved me, that Jesus died on the cross for me. Things like that that are uh, so valuable to learn and, and believe at a young age. Um, I was surrounded by people that affirmed me in that. A uh, potentially not so great reason is that when you're constantly around believers, uh, chances are you're going to hear a lot of beliefs. Um, does that make sense? If you're around believers, they're going to share their beliefs with you, which is uh, a lot of times a good thing. If, if you believe something, it's good that you're able to share it. But when you're growing up, a lot of times when you have so many people telling you their beliefs and their interpretations, it can be difficult to kind of wade through and say, well, wait a minute, what is it that I'm actually supposed to believe? What is it that I'm actually supposed to be doing? And I know I'm not the only one who experienced that here growing up. Um, and then also when you fast forward, even as an adult, if you have spent your whole life in the church or if you're new to the church, chances are you've heard some different sermons. You've had some conversations with different people. You heard some different worship music. And you heard some people that said, well, this is important. This is more important. That's what we should be focused on. This is what we should be focused on. And it's difficult sometimes, even as an adult Christian, to determine what we should be doing. How should I be acting and why? There's a question that I want to focus on this morning. And that question is, what does it take to be a disciple? What does it mean to be a disciple, a follower of Christ? If I was to go around this room and to take the time individually to ask everyone, I'm sure we'd get somewhat different answers from everybody in the room. And a large reason for that is because everybody's journey of faith and relationship with God is, is somewhat, somewhat unique, which is, which is great. But it's also because we probably have a difficulty to really nail down what it is that disciples are supposed to be doing. If being a disciple was our job, if we were just getting hired as a disciple, what would our job description be? What would the roles and responsibilities we'd be uh, expected to be fulfilling? For the last couple of weeks, our youth Sabbath school has been looking at this exact question. And what's made it easy for us to look at it uh, in our youth Sabbath school is that Jesus actually speaks to this. Um, which, which is great. Uh, it makes it easier for us. It's like if you got hired at a job, you would want your boss to say, hey, here's what I'm expecting you to do. And Jesus does. Um, some of you may not be aware that he does, but he, he does. And it's in John chapter 15. 
In John chapter 15, Jesus lays out to his disciples, here's what I expect my disciples to be doing. And when he says this, when he lays it out, he doesn't just mean the 12 people that he's talking to. He's talking to anybody who wants to be a follower of him, wherever they are, whoever they are, and whenever they are. So let's dive right in to John chapter 15, and what we're going to look at is our first priority. Our first priority, and the first priority is um, what we're going to see as we go through this chapter, is that there's going to be three priorities. Jesus says there's three things that if you're my disciple, three things that you're going to be focused on, that you're going to be doing, and that you're going to be acting upon in your life. And the nice thing is that as Jesus is explaining this, he, he kind of goes through it priority by priority by priority. So first, we're going to look at the first priority. This is going to be in verses 1 through 8 of chapter John 15. And in this section, Jesus talks a lot about vines. We're going to look at this verse right here. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. This is probably a verse you've heard at some point or another. And it really sums up exactly what Jesus is saying in verses 1 through 8. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. He says, to be my disciple, you've got to be a branch that is connected to the vine. Jesus says, I am the vine. I am the life-giving energy that you should be drawing your life from. I love the word abide here. And I actually just had a conversation a couple weeks ago with Pastor Gary about this. And we were talking about how sometimes this gets translated as remain or dwell or something like that. But the idea of abiding is just that little bit more complex that, that makes it, a, a, I think, a better translation for this idea. But the problem is, abide isn't necessarily something that we talk about a lot outside of passages like this. I think the best way for us to understand it in this context is to look at the entire passage. And what Jesus is saying is that you would not expect a branch to be of any use apart from the vine. If we took it to a Southern California context, I wouldn't break off a branch of an orange tree and carry it around with me for a few months and expect it to bear oranges, to bear fruit, right? It's got to be connected to the tree in order to actually produce any fruit. In the same way, Jesus says, if you want to be a branch that produces fruit, you've got to be connected to the vine. Jesus says in verse 8, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Jesus talks in this section about how God is the Father, is the vine dresser, and he's coming to prune and make sure that the vine stays healthy. And he says, if you want to be a healthy branch that produces fruit, you want to be connected to me. And I think sometimes we could read this as a little bit of a threat. You could see how maybe you would read this and you would feel like, oh, okay, if I'm not connected to God, um, then I'm going to be of no use, and I'm just going to get thrown into the fire and cast away. I don't think it's simply a threat, though. I think it's a statement of truth. If you want to be a follower of Christ that produces fruit, who is actively growing, who is actively of use, you must get connected to the vine. You must abide in Christ. You must keep a hold of your connection and your relationship with God. You must abide. That's priority number one, abide. Priority number one is abide. Priority number two now. Priority number two. In that first section, verses one through eight, Jesus talks a lot about bearing fruit, which is great. Jesus talks a lot about food in his ministry, which um, maybe is the reason I'm a pastor. Uh, it just really speaks to me whenever somebody starts talking about, about food. Food analogies work for me. Um, hopefully they work for you, you too. But it's great to talk about the idea of bearing fruit as a disciple. But again, there's a lot of ambiguity there, right? What does it actually mean to bear fruit? I'm not actually sprouting bunches of grapes 
or oranges or whatever fruit. But yet Jesus says that if I'm his disciple, he expects me to bear fruit. So what is that fruit? In verses 9 through 17, Jesus tells us pretty much exactly what that is. We're not going to read that whole section, but we are just going to look at just three verses that I think will help um, us understand this and see if you can pick up on a theme in these three verses. So the first verse is going to be John uh, 15, chapter, uh, chapter 15, verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. All right, let's look at the next one. Verse 12. This is my commandment, that you, have lo- that you love one another as I have loved you. And then in verse 16, he says that we were appointed as his disciples in order that we might abide and bear fruit. And then he says in 17, to end this section, these things I have commanded you so that you will love one another. Did you catch the theme? If I was to ask you, what's the word, what's the verb that Jesus says is the second priority, what would you say? Love. Love. You guys are are with me. You guys are catching on. It's nice because it's not difficult to pick up on. Jesus is pretty clear about that. Jesus says, if you are a branch that is connected to me, the vine, and you want to be producing fruit, the fruit that you will bear will be love. Jesus says, this is why I appointed you to be my disciples. So that one, you could abide in me and stay connected to me. And then two, that you could produce fruit, that you could share love with one another. Jesus says, my disciples will abide in me and the fruit which they will produce will be love. Now for the final focus, the final priority. Priority number three. Um, This final section, verses 18 through 27, I think is where a lot of translations... um, I think maybe miss the point of what the message is that Jesus is trying to convey. It's not an issue with the translation itself, but if you go and look at your Bible at this section, usually there's a header there. And the header is usually what I would take an issue with. The header probably says something along the lines of hated by the world. Um, Something to the effect of nobody's going to like you if you love the way that I'm asking you to love. And while Jesus does talk about that, I'm not sure that that's really the priority that he wants us to be focused on. But Jesus does warn his disciples of opposition and trials to come in the world. He says, if you love the way that I'm asking you to love, the way that I have loved you, the way that my father loved me, people are going to push back against that. You're going to face some opposition. He also says, when you're facing that opposition, remember that I faced worse. Jesus says, remember, any opposition you face, any hatred you face, is nothing compared to the hatred which I experienced and which I endured. I think he says this for two reasons. I don't want to just gloss over this and jump to the last two verses. I want us to recognize that Jesus tells us everything that you're going through, I went through something worse. He says it, one, I think to keep us humble. Two, I think he says it to give us hope. Whatever you went through, Jesus went through something worse, and he endured. In verses 26 and 27, Jesus does, I think, say exactly what the priority, the last priority, the third priority he wants his disciples to have will be. He says this, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. You will bear witness. Bear witness. That's the third priority. Share the good news. Share the gospel. Share the goodness of God that you have received. Three priorities for his disciples. Now, now that we have looked at all three priorities, I want to recognize and make sure that we notice it's important that we get the order of operations correct here. Too often, we try to love before we try to abide. If you put priority two before priority number one, the love you have isn't going to be of much use. You'll be like a branch trying to produce fruit without being connected to the vine. Does that make sense? 
If you try to put priority three first, bear witness before you yourself abide and are filled by the Holy Spirit, chances are the, the programs you put on, the testimonies you share, the witness you provide isn't going to be of much use. In fact, it'll probably not only feel hollow, but you might end up feeling hollow yourself as a result. We must get the order correct. First, abide in Christ. Second, love one another. And third, bear witness to the world. That's our priorities. That's our job description right there. One thing I love about Jesus is that he has the ability to take what he says in a full chapter of the Bible, in John chapter 15, and he says it so poignantly in John 13, just two chapters before. He says it in one verse. In John 13, 35, Jesus says, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Love is the focus. Let love be your focus. In a world where everybody and everything is vying for your attention to be your priority in your life, even good things, your health, your career, friends, loved ones, media, entertainment, even things that you could say, this is good, this is good that I'm doing it, is it prioritized over the three priorities which Jesus says his disciples will have? Listen to the words of Jesus and act as his disciples would. If our church is meant to grow, if our own personal faith and relationship with God is meant to grow, we must do as Jesus says. Do you feel dead? Do you feel like a branch disconnected from the vine? just slowly withering away because you aren't connected to the vine that's the life source, the life energy. Get connected to God. Abide in him. Seek him out. Get to know him. Do you feel fruitless? Like a fig tree full of leaves with no fruit to show for it. Learn to love. Prioritize it. See how Jesus loved and seek to emulate that in your own life. Or do you feel burnt out? Like your efforts to share Christ are fruitless, worthless. Don't give up. Don't stop sharing the gospel and the good news. But make sure that you don't prioritize it over your own fulfillment and your own joy and your own love. Remember, apart from Christ, you can do nothing. Abide in him first. Love others second. And serve them through the goodness of the overflow uh, within you. Let us all be disciples in this church. Whether we are young or whether we are old, whether we're frogs on the stage or whether we're sitting in the back pew, I pray that we will all learn to abide, learn to love, and learn to witness about the goodness of God. Amen.